got here right away. Like I, I'm from the east coast of Canada, and I thought it was cold there, and I got here, and it's so much more cold. I'm pretty sure Ottawa is like known for being the city with the largest variation of temperature throughout the year. Right. So we'll get like plus forty in the summer, and then the winter we've had like minus forty, and it's pretty deadly. And yeah. it hit us quick, like probably a week ago, where people were wearing shorts and like hoodies outside, and it was like. 15 degrees and then all of a sudden it just dropped 30 degrees snowed for like four days and winter <laughs> begun yeah it feels Christmassy though it does. a lot a lot more so than back home anyways it definitely does yeah I had a uh, few days where I came out and just kind of put me in a good mood to see the sun coming down you know quiet streets felt like the holidays yeah I find uh this is my first time actually in Ottawa I've been to Toronto multiple times but I find it's like way more like wholesome here like it just feels like a super uh I don't know, like safe place and stuff like that. For sure. It's definitely, I feel like it's one of the safer cities around because it's so like government run and there's so much like suburbia and just kind of like family, families living here. It's a lot more chill, a lot less like hustle and bustle. But like, I kind of feel like it also means you get less, less ambitious people. Toronto's yeah. all like ambition people trying to make a thing for themselves, trying to like climb their career, make something, do something. And here they're just kind of like chilling. So, yeah. a little boring, but <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think there's, like, there should be a balance for sure. I find, like, yeah, th- so Bay Street, Toronto, it's, like, just, like, go, go, go. Yeah. But then it's, like, there's no balance, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I think that it's certainly important. Um, like, I, I personally like it here a lot because of that. For sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, are you, like, are you from here originally? I was born, actually, like, an hour or so outside of Toronto in a town called Burlington. But then my parents like thought it would be better raising kids in a city like Ottawa for reasons like we said. Yeah. So when I was about two years old, we moved here, and I've been here ever since. Cool, man. Um, what do, What do your parents do? Uh, my mom is a social worker, and my dad is like he works for the city of Kingston now. They moved to Kingston. He's like a IT tech guy, the chief information officer. Oh, sweet. One of those jobs where you're never really sure what he's doing, but he's in IT and behind the scenes and computers and stuff. Yeah, something I could never do. Yeah, me either. Yeah, I can't, I can't figure out technology. I can barely operate this. So, um, so why don't we go back and just talk about how did you first get into bodybuilding? Kind of, I guess it all started with much like falling in love with the gym and training. So I played a lot of sports growing up. My parents were the parents where if I said I wanted to try something, they put me in it. So I played like every sport you can imagine that any kid ever does. And I fell, I kind of fell out of a bunch of them that I wasn't good at or I wasn't into and I fell into track and field, basketball and football. Mm -hmm. And track and field I loved because it was just a solo sport. It was all about the training aspect, similar to bodybuilding. And it was just like kind of you're on your own, you're training and you're getting better at a skill really. Football I liked too, but I wasn't really an aggressive kid. And I didn't want to like hit people or I couldn't like get angry on the field or anything. So I was like quick and athletic. But there was that, and I kind of, I felt, like I said, the track part, I loved the training, so I ended up in the gym a lot more than anything else, so I wasn't good at, like, catching a ball in football or dribbling in basketball, but I could jump really high, run really fast, but I trained a lot, mm-hmm. and then when I got a little older, and obviously, you're either really good at sports or you're not, and you kind of stop around grade 12, yeah. I wasn't very good, so you drop out of sports, and I fell into the gym, and then, specifically into bodybuilding, it was 100% my brother-in-law now. Who got me into it when I was in grade 12 he started dating my sister and he was like the biggest guy in Ottawa this huge smaller than I was now but he was like this huge guy to me yeah. that like was this unattainable massive guy that I like looked up to in the gym and stuff and he saw that I had a lot of potential being a little 16 year old kid with a lot of muscle on me and after they dated for about a year and a half or something and I graduated high school took a year off to university and he thought it would be a good idea for me to try a bodybuilding show so he kind of got me more into training, taught me more about the nutrition and stuff, and I saw a lot of success doing that. So me and my sister actually together decided to do a bodybuilding show at the end of the year, and he trained us for it, coached us both for it. It was down in Sudbury. We drove eight, do- eight hours down to it. The whole family came down and watched, mm-hmm. and it was probably the trial run where if I had done bad, I probably might have never done it again. Right. But what happened is like I did amazing. I ended up winning the show, juniors and overall men's bodybuilding. My sister also won overall for a woman's figure. And it was just like being on stage felt so amazing. With one of those things where it just kind of felt right. Mm-hmm. And from there, everything just kind of snowball effect just kept going. That's so cool, man. So so you you did a competition like with your family member. Not many people do that. Yeah. It was, we've never actually done one 
I don't think where the three of us have competed, but I've com- actually at the live 2018 Olympia, we all we were all there competing. Really? Yeah, that's nuts. So. Yeah, I recently did. Uh, so like, my dad was big into powerlifting. Mm-hmm. He just recently came out, uh, and we competed in uh, Central Newfoundland. So we drove out there, and he competed for the first time since like the 80s. Really? And that was a cool experience for me mm-hmm. because he kind of got me into the sport. Um, I think it's important too when you're like transitioning into a new sport, such as bodybuilding or powerlifting, to have somebody who like takes you under their wing. Absolutely. Like that's what kind of like dad did to me, and mm-hmm. it sounds like your brother-in-law did. It definitely you know. helps with like the learning curve too. Like I'm sure you had a lot of success at a young age in powerlifting. I'm sure mm-hmm. a lot of that helps with having the knowledge of him for a young person instead of kind of learning the ropes on your own. Right. Kind of takes a lot of trial and error out of it. Do you remember your stats like when you just started? Like how tall were you when you first got got into the gym? How tall? How heavy? What your lifts were or whatever? I can't really remember like the very beginning because I started when I was like 14, I think I started training. I can't really remember how much I weighed, but I remember when I was 17 in high school, beginning grade 12, I was about 225 pounds. So pretty big kid in high school and I could squat 405 for like three, three or four reps. I remember I could deadlift five plates for one, and I could bench three fifteen for two. Yeah, that's. I was graduating in, high school. In high school. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's huge actually because a lot of people go their whole lives and never deadlift like five plates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's crazy. I was like I, I told, we were talking about earlier. I was younger. I trained for strength a lot. I was pretty much stronger back then than I am now. But right. Different goals, I guess. Do you do you miss training for strength at all? I do. I do sometimes for sure. I still enjoy the way I train now and like pushing myself in more like volume and intensity in the sets, but it's definitely fun when you hit a hit a new PR. It just feels good to pull like six hundred pounds off the floor. It's just kind of very <laughs> dominant, like dominating feeling. You know? Yeah, like a primal feeling. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so like that back workout you took me through earlier is that where like you were probably taking that easy on me, or is that like actually a workout that you would normally do? That's pretty. That's the pretty typical workout a little slower i'd say Definitely. like when you were like saying like oh, i'm going to take a break between the set after we had just talked for a few minutes normally we'd be pushing it through a lot quicker right that like if sense. i turn with someone else it's kind of just bouncing back and forth there's no chatting or waiting between yeah and do you normally train with training partners or go alone typically i go alone i don't mind training with people but a lot of my friends i train with aren't as serious as i am so they just kind of use it and excuse to chat mm-hmm. and at times that's good but not really or if my brother-in-law's around i train with him a lot but he lives on the other end, other end of the city now, so it's kind of hard to do that. But Yeah. I, I, I mean, one thing that I'm pulling from this conversation already is that it seems like you're surrounding yourself with people who also have similar goals in terms of bodybuilding and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, how important do you think that is? I think it's very important if you're doing it the right way, kind of. Like, I've, we all have the same goals, like my family and a few of my friends and stuff, but the more, more important part is I think we all have the same values and everything outside of that in life so I've obviously traveled around a lot and trained with a lot of people and there's a lot of people I meet with like not the same values at all as me and they're kind of like just like not good people who are just kind of out for themselves and stuff and me being around them they're bodybuilders too but just every other aspect kind of makes me feel like a shittier person to be honest right whereas my kind of family are the people who kind of made me who I am and I find we have very similar values so that on top of being interested in bodybuilding definitely helped a lot yeah. So it keeps you focused and your head on right, I'd say. Yeah, I find, uh, yeah, like I, th- I think there's something to be said about training, like surrounding yourself with people who have similar goals, um, but similar values is, is harder to find, but if you find it, it, it can really, really work well. For sure, yeah. Um, how many days a week would you, like, do you normally train? Do you train six days a week or, like, what do you normally do there? It, it used to be seven, and then I started <laughs> to get older. Yeah. I mean, older, I'm only. 24 now but even that started to beg on me so I switched down to six and five every now and then too so I'll take one or two days off a week depending how broken I feel in that week right so do you do cardio at all or I do uh, I mean like a bodybuilding track? version of cardio like walking on a treadmill for maybe 20 30 minutes a day mm-hmm. I still do that every single day in the morning it just kind of gets me in the right mindset it's a good way to start the day I feel weird eating breakfast unless I've like done cardio before now so right. I just do that kind of to wake up every morning Right. Um, do you ever try running? I have. I think I'm a little too heavy for that now, sadly. Yeah. I used to run a lot. I used, when I was like, younger, I used to run to my gym because I couldn't afford a license. Mm-hmm. I'd run to the gym and train and run back, but 
uh, like the t- the years of training heavy and stuff and being 250 pounds or so the impact on my knees is just too much and it hurts but I do miss it yeah so what did you think like like helped you the most from going from we'll call it an amateur to you know really excelling at the sport and obviously becoming Mr. Olympia I think I mean there's nothing like interesting you can really hear but the bodybuilding secret which isn't the secret it's just consistency mm-hmm. the more things in your life you can be consistent at the better you are at everything so I always like when I was in university let's just for an example I would have all year where I would train hard and eat what I could but I'd also party on the weekends and if I missed a meal or workout I didn't really care and I didn't think it really affected me because I was young and making beginner gains and all that and it was like whatever and then all summer long, I would prep for a show and everything would be on point, bed every night, same time, never miss a meal, never miss a workout, cardio and all that. that but that would only be for three or four months a year. And then off season would come again, I would start eating like shit, going out all the time, just like not really caring, you know, get yeah. my calories where I could. But then when I kind of made the switch, I, I dropped out of school to really focus on everything. I stopped partying with my friends. I still lived with them for a while and that was hard to yeah, yeah. watch them party and do their shit and just kind of sit back and let them go and stay home. But when I made that transition of like all year long being consistent with absolutely everything I did and every everything I thought about in my mind was, is this going to excel me in bodybuilding or is this going to bring me back? So if it was like a trip, going somewhere on a weekend with friends or stuff, I'm like, can I bring my meals? Am I going to miss it? Is there a gym there? Can I do this? Or before I wouldn't care about taking four days off and going to drink or something. Right. And I think just that transition of putting everything I had into it every single day all year long versus like three months out of the year, I really like in that year, I kind of everything just switched. And that was the year I ended up turning pro, winning a pro show and getting the Olympia. So What year was that? Uh, it was 2017. Oh, wow. 2016, I guess, to 2017. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy, man. So, yeah, the, the, like, the consistency thing is something that, like, like again, my background's in powerlifting, so, but I, I definitely understand because when I was, like, I had a couple of years where I was, like, really, really dominating, and I found, like, that was in 2014, 2015, and the switch was, again, like, not making sure I didn't drink at all, yeah. basically, so I would drink, like, twice a year at one point and it was after a competition national nationals and worlds mm-hmm. and that was really it um and you you really have to make those sacrifices you have to not i don't want to say cut out those people but um there's you definitely people yeah you kind of <laughs> do. do there's people who like try and influence you right mm-hmm. they want you and i mean they don't mean any harm by it but they do interfere with your goals For sure. it's one of those things you quickly learn where like 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 you you said you were at the top of the powerlifting game to be at the top of anything you do need to cut things you enjoy out people you might still like you need to cut a lot of shit out of your life because you really you can't there's no balance at the top of the game of anything no there's no like where do you find balance in your life it's like you don't <laughs> you're either winning or you have balance you know so right because a lot of shit you got to cut out and just kind of focus on what you got to focus on so what do you what do you do outside of bodybuilding for fun a tough question lately not a whole whole lot to be honest i find bodybuilding has brought so many opportunities for me to kind of travel and see so many new places that that's almost become like what's fun for me i love checking out new cities meeting new people like i like to train alone all the time but when i travel it's fun to train with new people and kind of learn new things but other than training completely and stuff i like to, i actually read a lot which Do I don't really talk about or anything, but I'm into like fantasy books and stuff. Okay. So I've read all the Game of Thrones books. I've read uh, like a Mortal Instruments series, and I'm on to this book, The Gunslinger series by Stephen King. Yeah. So there's about like eight or nine books in that. And I love series books. I watched the movie, actually, Gunslinger. The movie was shit. Yeah, it was The movie major. pissed me off, honestly, because I didn't even like the books at all. Really? And I, I love the books, so I was excited for it, but it ruined it for me. Do you ever read any, uh, any business books? And stuff like that. No, I probably no? should though. Yeah. Yeah, I'm ac- I'm actually surprised that you don't because like you're somebody who like has a lot going on in terms of athlete, business person. I find there's like there's always principles that you can take from athletics mm-hmm. and apply them, especially to business. Oh, and 100%. Yeah, you, like I think you you would like it a lot. I I, I really think you would. I I haven't like read into it, but that stuff I've looked into. Because like I said, so much of my life was just so purely focused on bodybuilding to get where I am. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm kind of here, I'm like, there's a lot of stuff I realize I could be capitalizing on that I don't feel like I am. Mm-hmm. Like, I still feel like I'm not doing enough all the time. So it's something where I would like to 
take the kind of personal skills you learn from bodybuilding, like you said, and put it into more like a business side of things for mm-hmm. sure. Right. So in terms of like your business goals or I guess not, not really business goals, but like you, you just became Mr. Olympia. Um, like how many more big competitions do you think you'll have in your, in your career? My career? I mean, hopefully just the Olympias. So, and I always told myself, even if I could make it that long, I would never want to compete to the age of 30. Because I find, like, uh, my goal was to get to the Olympia at first. And I got there, and I was like, shit, I can actually win it. And then the goal was just to win it. And then when I won it, that it was almost like, like, it was a grateful moment. But I almost felt like I could just do more than just that, you know? So I wanted to win it a couple of times, but I feel like there's something, like, past that I want to kind of like build on which I'm not even really sure what it is yet but Olympia wise if I could get like three or four I'd definitely be happy and be ready to tap out if my body even allows me to do that right do do you know what you plan on doing like after bodybuilding like I have a few kind of business ideas that are kind of on the down low that I want to start Mm -hmm. to kind of get rolling but that's like hopefully I can get that rolling and move on to something else but I'm not really 100% sure I'd like to kind of cre- find something some way that I can create like a community of people who are just like whether it's it's like a I set up like a gym or something and it's more than a gym it's people kind of coming in and helping each other like lifting each other up in all aspects in life or something online that's like a some kind of community that I could build that kind of just people helping each other out to like success in any avenue not just bodybuilding but I don't it's very loose thoughts in my mind but it's something that like I'd like to somehow tie into what I built in bodybuilding to that. I find a, a sad thing th- that happens in a lot of sports is when the like when the champ doesn't know when to to stop. You know For what sure. I mean? Yeah. When when like I, I'm a big UFC fan. Um, back in the day, like Chuck Liddell, for example, like was dominant, and then he just, just kept, kept getting going, in yeah. there and kept getting knocked out and kept getting knocked out. And I find it's re- it's really tough as an athlete to know when when to stop so it's actually cool to hear like from yourself somebody at the top that you 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 kind of already have an exit strategy Mm -hmm. i mean part of that is because i've had had some health complications in the past but even before that all arose and i like knew exactly what was causing all that i i always knew that there was more in the world from bodybuilding and like we talked about all the sacrifices you make and whatnot Mm -hmm. i want to experience a lot more life than just like every single day focusing on getting my meals in and training and all that because it really, it takes up your entire year. You're either getting ready for prep or in prep and worried about travel, missing meals and all that and stuff. And I just find, I enjoy it right now, but I know there's a lot more in life and something I would probably get sick of. Yeah. So do you find, like, I mean, I'm sure there's times where you're like, this is awful. Like during prep and stuff like that, you mentioned <clears throat> earlier, how many calories did you get down to? Like 1,600 or I something? About 1,600 calories at the very end, yeah. Yeah, like that's... That's bananas to me. Um, so, but like overall, like what keeps you, I, I guess what keeps you motivated to keep going like when I you're mean, feeling like that? Uh, everyone always asks me that. And I made, I made a, I actually thought about it for once and I made like a post about it the other day on Instagram and it was based off the typical answer you hear people say like champions and people who are great at anything aren't motivated all the time. They're the kind of people who put in the same amount of effort and work into something even when they're not motivated. Mm-hmm. Because, like, at the end of my prep, I had no motivation for shit. I had no reason. I couldn't think of why I was doing anything. But it was, like, never once did I think about quitting or not wanting to do it or not making it through. Because it just, like, like felt, like, instinctive that I just keep going. I guess kind of, like, the discipline that you build over the years and everything is just, like... It's, like, something in my head just, you can't quit. You don't quit. You don't even think about it. Right. So, it's hard to say Kind of an innate nature you feel like you just have, I think. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, do you find now that you've won, like now that you've reached, like there's no no higher that you can do, right? Like you've hit the pinnacle of the sport. Essentially, yeah. Right. Do you think that your motivation has diminished since winning? Like there's the, the saying, like, you know, sleeping in silk underwear or whatever. Uh, do you think that has any merit? I don't think so, no, because I've I've never been someone who's overly like cocky or ahead of myself, and for a long time I wasn't even sure if I was had was capable of winning the Olympia, and I think as much as I believed that this year I could do it and I had every opportunity to, it still almost came as a shock to me when I did, and 
realizing that I did kind of like unlocked even more potential within me being like damn I did this and I, f I feel like I'm super young and I haven't even nearly tapped out my genetic potential or anything in bodybuilding so I feel like I'm definitely motivated to kind of prove I can take it a little bit farther and just kind of dominate for a while yeah that's awesome yeah because it, it can go either way right like people can win and then they lose motivation mm -hmm. because they're like well now now what or like yourself like you you seem like you you're understanding that like this is just like the tip of the iceberg yeah. for you like you could keep going with it for sure yeah no that's that's cool um so like do you find it's easier to train as a champion or is it easier to train as the underdog it's hard to say because like i've only been the champ for like two months now and kind of uh, after after a show, everyone's kind of like ready to take a take a break for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, that's kind of a lie, I guess. For the, for two weeks after, I was like back on diet and back training. I was like, "Yo, I could do another competition." I wanted to keep pushing and do another competition, do something else. But I was like, "There's no point. There's kind of nothing going on." And then now I'm at a point where I've taken, like I was telling you before, I was not eating very much, kind of giving my body a break, my digestion a break from everything, and not training quite so much. So. At this point, I'm not really into my off season or anything, so I don't have a whole lot of motivation at the moment. But I'm definitely excited to get back to pushing myself again. So I would say it's really no high, no less or no more motivation. It's just kind of the same thing, you know. I was working hard before. I'm going to be working hard now. Nothing's changed. Yeah. I still got to earn the title next year. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. The, um, do you find it difficult to like get in good training sessions when you're on the road? Like if you were, for example, traveling with a company somewhere uh, in the States, for mm -hmm. example, or visiting your girlfriend, do you find it difficult like to train somewhere outside of your home gym? No. For, for me, it literally just depends on the flight, how much it messes me up. Right. Because sometimes I'm like, I got bad ears, internal ears, they pop really bad, I get a headache for a day or two after flying or something, and that can mess with me, but... Being in a new environment or something like that honestly usually gives me a better workout. And typically if I'm on the road and I'm training with someone else, maybe another bodybuilder who I want to like almost prove myself, yes, I train my ass off, or someone better than me, like a Jay Cutler or someone on the road, I'm like, okay, hey, I gotta hang with the champ, you know? Or if, even if I'm on camera, that kinda, you can't slack on camera, you know? Yeah. So there's always some reason why you can keep pushing yourself on the road. And I honestly just like trying a new gym, so it helps me a lot. Who, who do you, like, draw inspiration from, whether that's bodybuilding or outside? Bodybuilding-wise, there's people like Jay Cutler, like I just mentioned, who I definitely look up to a lot. He kind of encompasses, I feel like, everything around the sport and the business. He kind of, he's not one of those guys with just elite genetics who kind of gets by doing whatever. You know, he, he worked his ass off, and mm -hmm. he didn't have the most title that of me, but he definitely earned them. And on top of that, he built a crazy business, a crazy name for himself, and just so much respect everybody has for Jay. So that's definitely someone I look up to. Um, my brother-in-law, too, is obviously someone I look up to a lot because he's the reason I got into bodybuilding. And I've never seen someone so consistent, like I talked about before, with anything in my life. Like, I'll still have meals where I'm, like, at my parents, I'm like, screw it, you're making lasagna, I'm going to eat your lasagna. We literally went on a family trip this weekend, had lasagna at my grandparents' uh, retirement home. He brought with him two Tupperware of food because he couldn't miss a meal, didn't eat the lasagna, had to get his meals in. And he's full off-season, just, like, whatever. Yeah. But wouldn't miss a meal even on the road. So he's insane. That kind of discipline he has definitely is something I look up to. And I'd say in life, the answer would be my dad. He's someone, he's not really into bodybuilding so much or the fitness aspect, but he's like worked his ass off like my entire life and he's never complained or bitched about anything. He was that guy who would work all day, work his ass off, come home and still take care of the kids, be in a good mood. And they just find like, he's like, to me, the perfect father, an amazing husband and someone I'd like, if I ended up like half as much as him as a dad or husband in the future, I would think I'd be doing pretty good. So I'm getting, I'm getting emotional here. <laughs> thinking about this, man. That's cool though. I, yeah. I love hearing that stuff that you're close to your family and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's, that's awesome, man. Um, do you plan on like having kids and stuff when you're older? I definitely would like to. Yeah. I feel like, I've, like I said, there's a lot in life you want to accomplish for yourself personally, but eventually I feel like there's a higher purpose of like creating a, another being, I guess, a family and kind of raising them up. And I think it'd be just fun and exciting. Like mm -hmm. 
to raise little to people. raise a little people. Yeah, yeah like, it, like there it goes seems like me. such a strange concept. Like I decide what you are going to become. Pretty much how I act. So I think that's really cool. And yeah. from what I learned from my parents, it's not so much what you like tell your kids to do or be, but the example you set for them. Mm -hmm. They're gonna pay attention. And they're gonna become pretty much who you are, whether you tell what you, whatever you tell them. So I think that's almost like a lot of pressure it puts on you to be a better person yourself and kind of an exciting thing yeah for sure i find i found like um like my me and my dad are really close and he said like the hardest job is to be a parent i can't and imagine like, yeah because like he's like you got to show up like every day right every and then i'm like yeah it's, always. yeah it's true <laughs> yeah. and like kids learn not only by like words you say but like how you act exactly. right and uh yeah no that's cool um you mentioned before that you were in university before. Mm -hmm. um, where did so tell me about that experience? Like, where did you go to school? Uh, what were you studying? Stuff like that. Yeah, so after high school, I took a year off because I wasn't really sure where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do, and I obviously I had to make some money to get to school. Yeah. And then at that point, I decided I just wanted to try something new, so I moved across country over the East Coast, went to Dalhousie University in Halifax, and I was studying health sciences there. So they had a it was, a, it was kind of a program where it, at the beginning it was pretty generic health sciences and then you moved on to like something like radiology or respirology and something like that and I never got to that point. So when I was finished about into two years into my degree, I ended up dropping out to focus on bodybuilding and stuff. But I did live there for four years and I did a bit of it part time and I missed a semester so I was there for a little bit longer. But it was definitely an amazing experience for me, and though I didn't finish my degree, I definitely don't regret going at all because it changed me a lot. Kind of moving out of your parents' house, moving across the country, having no friends, meaning to meet new people, and just kind of like create a whole life at such an like important stage in your life when you're just kind of becoming a young adult. Mm -hmm. I found it really kind of shaped me and who I am today. It allowed me to experience a lot and learn a lot. Just as soon as you're thrown, thrown into the real world, everyone knows that at that point it's like shit. Shit hits you like differently, you know? Yeah, yeah. You gotta learn how to do cook, laundry, everything, all the bills you gotta pay, everything, you gotta work, go to school, all the responsibilities on you. So definitely moving across the country and having all that. Def and some of the friends I made there too, some of the best friends I've ever made in my life. And though we don't live close together right now, they're people I'll always be close to. And definitely grateful for, for all the opportunities I had there. Right. So, like, are you still like friends with them? like today a lot of me yeah. my one best friend i lived with throughout the entire time down there he lives like two hours away and i don't get down there enough but we still chat all the time and talk a lot and i'm planning on going to visit him soon he'll come down here and stuff so yeah. okay cool is he is he from here or is he from, He's from East Toronto. Coast? Oh, okay yeah so he just went to school in dal, went dal to school well. down and he moved to montreal after yeah nice i've actually never been to montreal <laughs> Very French. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I, heard, I heard it's amazing, though. It is. They got good food, good gyms. Yeah. The cool culture there, yeah. Yeah, I'm sold. I gotta go. Um, do you think you'll ever go back, like, after you're done bodybuilding and stuff like that, do you th think you would ever go back and, and finish your university? Like, would you... Yeah. Would you, would you do that? Would you, f like, go in and finish health science or go into something new or just keep going with I don't think so no if you ask my mom she sure loved me too my parents were old school believers that you know you, yeah. after high school you gotta go get your university degree and it's the only way you can get a job <laughs> which I get it they that's what was right for them yeah. and they just want the best for their kids but at this point I really don't see any benefit from going mm -hmm. unless somehow I lose absolutely everything in this world and all my dreams and aspirations right now just kind of fail into the shitter yeah. Yeah. then maybe I'll go back and start something new but at this point I can't see myself going back now. Yeah, no, fair enough. Yeah, our parents are, like, from different... Well, th there was no opportunity in terms of, like... In there was no, like, internet, right? Exactly, like, there was yeah. not, like... You couldn't do anything. Like, uh, I remember, like, when, you know, I told my dad that people can make money from, like, online coaching. He was like, there's no way. Like, that's that's not a thing. That's not <laughs> like, a lot, yeah. you know, but um, is that... So, is that something you dabble with, with coaching? I do a little bit, Yeah. Depending on like the time of year, how busy I am or whatnot, like obviously in Olympia prep, I don't really have a lot of focus on that. So I have a few people going around around the year that I've been helping for a while that I, I stick with, but I do I dabble in it, just not a whole lot. Are they mainly like from like Canada or? It's all online, really. Yeah, right. so I don't do anything in person. Yeah, no personal trip. There's a few from Canada. There's one in my local city here in Ottawa, mm -hmm. but mainly from the states and all around. 
Yeah, yeah. The states is huge for the, the bodybuilding scene. Crazy, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, are you a fan of any other sports, like besides? I've never like watched sports personally myself a whole lot. If I had to pick my favorite one, it would be basketball. Been a fan of the NBA since I was younger. I watched it when I was younger, but I kind of fell out of watching any sports for that. It wasn't a big interest of me. Did you ever go to a live game? I've been to a um, Chicago Bulls game last year, I think, because my girlfriend's uh, mom's husband works for them. He's Stacy King. He used to play on the Bulls team, so he got us free tickets and oh, brought wow. us down. We kind of sat courtside and got to go in through the back way with him, which was a really cool experience. Yeah. But they weren't a very good team last year, so they got <laughs> destroyed, and it wasn't that exciting, but it was cool. I heard that one of the like coolest experiences... Um, for Canadians, if you're if you like going to sporting events, anyways, is to go to a Raptors game. I heard like they're nuts. Last year, being pretty close to Toronto, we went. Was it last year? When did they win the championship? Yeah, last year. Last year, yeah, we went went down for some of the games. Not the last game, but uh, some of the games in the finals. And just being in the city, we were right downtown, kind of being around, and it was insane. Like the streets. You couldn't like leave your. You couldn't drive because the streets were just filled with people, just people going nuts. So it was pretty cool, especially after like no one really gives a shit about sports in Canada because we're not very good. But everyone kind of bandwagoned on and just had a blast on it. It was exciting. Yeah, I think like doesn't like isn't Drake like an ambassador or something for like yeah. for the Raptors? Or I, don't, something? I don't know what he is, but they let him do whatever he wants. He's on the court talking to the refs, doing whatever, and some people get mad, but I mean kind of funny doing this thing i seen him like lacing chirps into athletes too oh, yeah. like last year like big time huge yeah. he was wearing he puts on t-shirts that have like graphics on them kind of <laughs> chirping the other players which is hilarious but. yeah that's jokes um in terms of uh, i'm drawing a blank here <laughs> i don't know i was trying to think of something there we're we at the 25 we'll, minute mark then. we'll have to edit this out <laughs> Yeah, we're at thirty. We're at thirty-two minutes. Yeah, we're past. I already, I already reset the camera. Did you? Yeah. Oh, okay. I just didn't know it. Yeah, that's good. What else can we talk about? Because I have a bunch of questions to ask you, but I sent. Yeah, do you want me to go through some? No, no, but I mean, like, we could do that in a separate video, right? Yeah. yeah. That's gonna be the workout tomorrow. Yeah, so I'll be asking you. These are like, for that video, it'll be like, quick questions so I'll get you to look at those tonight or at some point mm -hmm. and come up with those um, is there anything like you wanted to talk about in particular <sighs> it's hard to say I know it's tough I don't know why like yeah. uh, it's like really. I just this is sort of off topic but I'll bring it up um, have you heard of One Punch Man no there's, there's a book on that do you, do you watch like anime kind of stuff too? No. Or like books? I think you'll like One Punch Man. The One concept Punch. is pretty cool. Um, I think it's just, it's like a superhero. Yeah. And he, he can like destroy anyone with one punch. <laughs> and it's like sort of depressing because like he wants to be like fighting good like villains and stuff, but, but he can always just knock him out with one punch. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, and he just gets depressed because he's too good? Yeah, like he's too good. So there's a there's like an English version of the anime which is pretty interesting, and then there's a book on it too. But like a lot of it is about like the actual other characters that he encounters. Oh, okay. so there's storylines about the other characters. But yeah, it's pretty pretty interesting. I think I've heard of it, but I've yeah. never seen it anywhere. Yeah, it's, uh, it's maybe I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, we could talk about sponsorships. Like, what's like, yeah, what's what's one thing that you would recommend to people who. You maybe are amateur bodybuilders or climbing the ranks into becoming pros, or they maybe they are a pro already. Like, how would you recommend them? I guess to like grow their following and to get sponsors. That's a hard one because I think I, I kind of got lucky and fell into it. Like a lot of people now with everything they talk to me about, I want to be get sponsored. I want to become an IFBB pro. I never really like had those exterior goals you know I just like enjoyed bodybuilding and I shared what I did and it kind of developed into what it did so I mean I always tell people don't try and like just like watch YouTube social media and see someone and copy them because it's gonna feel fake and no one's really gonna enjoy it so if you are trying to like put yourself out there you gotta just actually be yourself mm -hmm. and at this point now consistency is so important even 
where I'm at right now, it's like all the algorithms and everything and how you can even get seen. If you're inconsistent on posting stuff like YouTube, I remember when I had my I had my videographer Calvin posting. We had two or three videos a week every week for almost a month, and everything just like blew up. I had so much attention on me. All the like analytics and stuff that showed you everything was just ten times what it's ever been. Mm-hmm. And then he left. I stopped posting so many videos and stuff, and it just kind of dropped down. So even at my spot right now where I am, consistency is so important. If you just kind of pop in and out, people kind of lose interest so quick, which is like our society. You know, everyone like someone for a month but like me if i lose the olympia next year people might stop caring they'll pick the next guy you know how, pretty crazy how do you deal with like uh i'm sure you get a lot of like haters or trolls how do you deal with that like i don't know i've never i've just never really been bothered by it honestly i think one thing i'm like one if i could say one thing i'm like impressed with myself the quality i have is i'm very self-aware so a lot of things I know that aren't good about me, I know them. Things that are good, I do know it. So if someone t- says something, bring down something I don't care about or whatever, I like, I just know it's not true. Or if it is true, I'm like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> like, you know, whatever. Like, um, my hairline has been receding, and everyone calls me out on that all the time. I not even bad, but I used to have, like, a perfect, nice hairline so back. <laughs> People try and tear me apart for it online, but, like, it's true. So, like, why am I going to be sad about it, you know? It doesn't bother me. People are crazy. People are the, the blows my mind. I didn't notice. So, yeah, hair still looks good to me, man. Appreciate um, it. Yeah, that. Do you ever like? Do you ever pop off at somebody in the in the comments? Do you ever like call Actually, someone out? Have I? <laughs> Honestly, no. The only thing that ever bothered me online is when people say stuff about my family or people I care about. So I made like maybe one or two videos with my sister in it. Maybe she didn't want to be in them because of that. But people kind of like said rude things about her I, mean, I get rude things about myself and everyone in my videos but when it was about someone I care about that bothered me a lot more than myself for some reason mm-hmm. so there are a few times I would kind of like fire back nothing crude or bad obviously just like things like hope your mother is proud of you typing this stuff on you and kind of stuff like that yeah. and it's funny whenever you do respond to a hater I find they like apologize almost every time like they're not expected to be called out they're just like they get the reaction they're like oh sorry man I didn't mean it and you're like they just wanted your attention. Literally, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that would bother me a lot, too, is, is like, yeah, we're, we're like, revealing our Achilles heel here uh, online. Yeah, so people are going to be like, I know attack his family. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, uh, it can be frustrating, I find, but, like, I, I used to, like, when I was younger anyways, I used to, like, you know, kind of bicker with people, but now I just, like, ignore it. Matter. It's all, it's literally, they're just doing it for that, it's just to give you that effect, you know? So if you do reply, you're just kind of giving them what they want. And yeah. There's no loss, no gain from it, so there's no point. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, so how many competitions do you have? Like, Do you plan on only doing, like, the Olympias? Or do you are you going to do, like, one-off, like, random cool competitions, like maybe in, like, Australia or something? Uh, probably right now I'm just planning on doing the one a year. It's a little bit of an unspoken rule, they say, for people to just do because you're the champ why do you need to do anything else because most shows are kind of working yourself towards the Olympia so if you're winning the Olympia you don't need to do anything else which is kind of how I feel also obviously it takes a huge toll on your body yeah. a lot of stress it's not healthy competing at all and with some health complications I already have I don't really want to push my limits past what they are so I feel like I don't need to do anything more than the Olympia and it allows me to kind of travel, meet more fans, do more things, take on more opportunities throughout the year, as well as getting ready for the next year, mm-hmm. and just focus on what's important to me, which is the Olympia. So you mentioned a couple times now health complications. Like what? So what are those? Like what have you had gone through? Yeah, so I guess I just found out actually in 2018, last year during prep for the Olympia, that I have an autoimmune disease. So it's flared up twice before, once really bad. Like I mentioned when I dropped out, when I was in university and I had to leave home for one year I had to drop out one semester because it hit me and I was in the hospital for a while and they had no idea what it was I just had all this like uh, fluid retention in my lower body and then I would actually have like some of my veins like bursting and stuff so there was blood sure. pooling in my feet and shit no idea what it was they put me on a, a prednisone which is like a corticosteroids immune suppressant mm-hmm. which is an awful drug too and that messed you up I was in a bed for like a month or something, didn't tell me what it was, didn't know what it was. Really? Kind of came back from that and was fine for about five years until last year getting ready for the Olympia. I think it was four weeks out, that water retention thing started to happen again. And I remember I went to a water park and I was in the sun 
And that night I had a bunch of water on my ankles and I was like, this must be from the sun. I should just take tomorrow off, relax, drink a lot of water. And then I ch was chugging water, woke up the next day, didn't pee at all. All the water I chugged just like held on to me, dropped it to my ankles. And I think I put on about 15 pounds in like oh a day. Oh my God. And obviously was scared. So I went to a doctor and they were like, just, you need to go to a hospital. Went to a hospital and I ended up being hospitalized for six days while I was four weeks out from the Olympia until three weeks out, I guess. So I was sitting in the hospital, not training, not eating anything, obviously. And that was terrifying experience, obviously. I didn't know what was going on. They did a bunch of tests, gave me some diuretics, got the water off, and then sent me home. And we were like, we'll give you the results when we do. And in a week out from the Olympia last year, I was still waiting, didn't know what was going on. Went to a doctor's appointment to tell me what it was the day before leaving for Vegas, not knowing if I'd actually be able to get on that plane. And the doctor told me I have this autoimmune disease called IgA nephropathy or Burgers disease, which is kind of like your immune system starts to attack your kidneys and they flare up and kind of mess with the filtration and whatnot. So that was happening at that point. And luckily I was able to get through the Olympia. I didn't think I looked good at all that year. I wasn't really happy because I still had some water retention. Uh, but I mean, just getting through that was yeah. one of the best moments of my life. For, like the biggest accomplishment I should have was honestly just getting on stage in 2018 and I came second, which almost felt like a bigger accomplishment than winning this year because I was put through so much shit. And then, <clears throat> like like I said, that's why after every year I take a lot of time off and let my body recover and kind of take the rest I need because the high stress, obviously, is what can cause an autoimmune thing to flare up. And I was lucky this year that it, it started to come back a little bit, but not nearly as bad and I was able to mitigate it. But it's something that will probably pull me out of competing earlier than maybe I'd like. But it's just something I gotta manage, and I'm in for blood work almost every single month. I do a urinalysis where I get to pee in a jug for 24 hours and collect it all and give it to them so they see what's going on. So I'm keeping on track of it, obviously, because health is like the most important thing. Yeah. But right now I'm able to mitigate it and live with it, and hopefully I can get a few more titles under my belt and then cash out. And yeah, before that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Did uh, is it like painful? It's not so much painful, no. It's energy, energy, It's weird. You almost I have times where it will flare up slightly, and I put on a lot of water weight, mm -hmm. and my energy is just gone. Like so, right. in prep, I literally already had no energy, and when I start to hold on the water, I just like you feel like your legs are waterlogged, and you're just dragging yourself around. So there's no pain. The first time I got sick in, high, in university, there was some pain in my stomach, but normally it's just very fatigued, and you just feel off. Yeah, but I, I guess more so than, than it, anything else, it would also just be a terrifying feeling. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Mentally was the hardest part. Especially when I was, literally would look at myself sometimes in the mirror and like be covered in like, you got no lines in your body when you're holding onto that much water, you know? I barely had any abs, no cuts in my legs or anything. And thinking I had to step on stage in front of like 10,000 people in a few weeks, that was uh, terrifying to push through. But I, can, I can't even imagine that, man. Like yeah. I've had, um, have you had any, any other injuries as well, like besides that? I That's tore a hamstring and some little things, but nothing too major. Yeah. Um, I herniated two discs in my back. And, like, I remember just the feeling of, like, there's parallels because I remember the feeling of, like, I know my own potential. Yeah. It's right here. And I c can't even come close. And I remember that feeling, you almost feel, like, hopeless and, like, upset. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine if you're there, you know, busting your ass... You, you know you're super disciplined and you have this expectation that you know you you can achieve and then you know you're, you're yeah. retaining fluids and especially stuff. when the other people don't know everyone like you look so good you look so good and like blah blah and I'm like no <laughs> I did not because you know what you're capable of but other people don't really see it as much as you do yeah that would be uh, <laughs> that would be mentally taxing for sure mm -hmm. um, yeah what, what do you think is like the one thing that you would give to someone like give them advice in terms of like a mental tip to get them into the gym like i know like we talked earlier about like exter external like external uh motivation um i think like someone shouldn't get in it for the wrong reasons and like you know you want to build your following and yeah i don't think you'll go very far um i guess yeah what's some advice that you could give i think you kind of hit the nail right there quick like you got to get in it for the right reasons and understand why you're doing something. If it's just like so many people now, like I was at a level one show here in Ottawa and so many people were literally just like before the show was over talking about wanting to 
get to national to get the pro card and just like blah 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 and they think when they get the pro cards they can get sponsors and stuff and they don't I feel like they're not even like enjoying their first level <laughs> one competition they're already thinking about getting the pro card and it just I know for me I know my brother-in-law my sister who have all been very successful in the sport we've never thought like that it was always like I'm getting ready for this level one show this is a big show to me right now and this is all I'm focused on I want to win that you know there's no nothing else going on and I know we all just kind of actually love the sport we love training we love pushing ourselves and it's what's allowed us to continue to do so working just as hard every single year day in and day out and not kind of lose any motivation because we started for the right reason so I guess if you're falling into something it's not really for you but other people think it's cool or you think other people do it or cool and you just want to be like them or get that I find those people people are often the ones who don't last very long yeah I, I think like people can there's a there's kind of a misconception as well like people think that like just say if you go into a competition you do well at it doesn't necessarily mean a sponsorship is gonna like no, fall into your lap because you also need a following yeah <laughs> um, and a personality <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, I mean, yeah. people are not gonna sponsor you unless you can do that stuff exactly um, for your sponsorships did you mainly have to like did you seek sponsorships or did they come to you they really always came to me before like when I was in school still and competing stuff I never looked at this being a job or what I was gonna do and I just got an email one one day and from a company and they offered me about like I think the first contract they got was like 20,000 a year mm -hmm. which for me, a first contract that was amazing. I remember running downstairs and like telling my sister, I was like, look, look, look. Like so excited for this, like like shocked that it was happening. I don't even know how they got my email. And I had since then it was just kinda like just kept doing my thing, sharing what I wanted to share, being me, and stuff just kinda came as it did and I never really seek the sponsorship now. Right. What do you find the hardest part about having an online presence is? It's hard to say. It's hard to keep up with it sometimes, for sure. I know sometimes I just want to, like, not focus on sharing this, taking a picture for this sponsor, kind of feeling like an advertise, walking advertisement and all that stuff. And you have a lot of eyes on you, so you're kind of... It's a high pressure, I think, to always look good and act good and be good. Mm -hmm. A lot of things. I know it's hard, especially at shows and competitions, but even just at expos, people don't really realize you're, like, a human being. So they just kind of like think you're like someone to meet, take a picture with and move on or whatever. And if you're traveling for like 12 hours across the world somewhere and depleted, just feel like shit or something and you kind of don't give someone as much time of day as they'd like, they'll go and like talk shit about you online and yeah. stuff. So you kind of always got to be on, always got to be ready to meet people, kind of got, always got to have a smile on your face and just grateful for everything around you. But Yeah, that, that's the tough part. Do you ever feel like you don't have any privacy, like you don't have a private life? Yes and no, sometimes. I, I think I found a pretty good balance. I share a lot of my life online, and but only stuff I'm comfortable with. But I think I found a pretty good balance at not putting too much on there and being able to separate. I think it's more, just important where you find your happiness and your values from. Like if I find all my values and like judgment from people online, of these people who really don't know who I am at all. Mm -hmm. You can listen to podcasts, watch my videos, but that's what I'm choosing to share with you. Yeah. So you really don't know me mm -hmm. and you don't know other people. So if you choose to like judge my character by that, fine. But I know those people don't know who I am, so I don't find any value from their comments or what they say. So I stick to kind of, like I said, the people important around me, like my family and stuff, and it kind of like keeps me very level-headed. What, what was the most like emotional moment for you over your competitive career? I think I said like uh, the that 2018 Olympia after kind of being in the hospital and not sure if I was going to make it, not sure if I was going to be able to keep competing at all anymore. And then stepping on stage, I remember my coach with Ian, my brother-in-law, who was always my sister too, they were always like, yeah, you look good, you got it, you got it. But they knew what I should look like and what I have looked like, yeah. and it wasn't that good. So they were a little bit stressed and worried, but they were always just like, you got it, just keep pushing, you got to keep going. And they, But there was a little underlying stress, like, okay, he might just like bomb it and come last place on stage. We don't know what he's going to look like. Because the day before, it didn't look good. We just had to suck all the water off me. But then getting on stage, and then they called me out for first call out. They put everyone back, and they had just me and Brian, who was the reigning champ, up there alone. So that's kind of what they usually do when you're top two. And I remember just like stepped on stage, like literally shaking. Like I couldn't flex my glutes because I was shaking. I was so nervous, worried I didn't look good enough. And then by the end of the 
time that we were on stage for prejudging, it just I was a new person. I was like confident, I was feeling good, I was ready to go. And I stepped off stage, my parents had somehow bypassed security, my sister was back there. And I looked at them and I remember they're all just bawling their eyes out crying. And I just like was happy and I just immediately just started crying for like five minutes. And there was like cameras on me, I remember. <laughs> I don't know where these videos are, but we're just with my family, just all backstage just limpid, just like bawling our eyes out, just like grateful that we made it through all this shit and accomplished what I could have accomplished. So definitely one of the most meaningful moments I've ever had. Yeah, that's amazing, man. Did you like share that experience like with your audience? Like did they understand the context at the time that it happened or were they just like, oh, Chris just came second? They just thought I came second, yeah. <laughs> I didn't tell I didn't tell anyone I was in the hospital even. I remember I disappeared from uh, like Instagram for a week or so and I just didn't tell anyone. I didn't want like that pressure out there. I didn't want anyone to know. I also didn't want any excuses before getting into the show. So I kind of kept it on the down low. But did did they know? It, this is not their first time. Oh, no, no. It. Okay. They're the, they're the whole 45-minute video of right, me right. my eyes out on the internet, <laughs> <laughs> explaining the experience. And I cried. It was soon after Olympia, I cried in the video filming it even. Yeah. But no, I've talked about it, yeah. It is emotional, and I think that like people people don't really understand that unless you compete at a very high level, how emotional mm-hmm. it is. Especially like when... I'll, I'll give you an example. Like, what, like I won the world title, and I just instantly felt like... I felt like somebody shot me with a like with a gun. Basically, I yeah. just dropped to my knees, and started crying because it was like the best feeling ever. And but one thing after was like that I struggled with was this is what I find interesting about this conversation is that afterwards I was like, well, well, now what? Because I found that like I hit the pinnacle of the sport when I was twenty, mm-hmm. and then was like, there's nowhere for me to go like anymore and I was so young yeah. that it kind of I think ruined my own motivation that's why I asked that question earlier um, I, I, had, I had a bit of that feeling coming home too where you're just like now what I did it what's next yeah but and right now I feel like I just want to push myself and do it again I also I also don't think I look my best on stage on stage this year so part of it is all just personal reasons that I realize I haven't tapped out my potential but I definitely experienced some of that this time coming home where you like you said what the hell what now right so when you come back from that and you like you know you take a couple weeks and you know or a couple months whatever the case may be and like clear your mind how do you personally like put a game plan in place so that you're like okay this is how i looked here september of last year next september i'm going to look way better how do you like plan that out i mean it's just kind of as any uh, any off season begins, you kind of pick out the body parts that I wanted to be better, and focus on them. So as I'm gonna get back in the training, I'm gonna fo- it's like for me it's back and arms. I'm gonna train my back and arms with a little more frequency throughout the week, and honestly train stuff less intense than I should. So that they're just kind of like it's almost like I'm just maintaining some muscle parts while trying to bring the other ones up. That's gonna kind of allow my body not to work too hard at building muscle everywhere, but just focus on places I need, like my back and arms. And on top of that, I mean, another thing is I believe every year you can come in a little bit leaner and better in shape, no matter how lean you are as a bodybuilder. So maybe next year I start my prep a week, prep a week or two earlier. And if I was looking like one point at four weeks out last year, I want to look like that at six weeks out this year. And to allow myself to be a little bit more ahead. So how far out, like, when, when you transition out of off-season and you're into a prep, like, how, how long do you take for prepping for a Mr. Olympia, for example? It, it kind of depends on how successful your off-season is and how lean you maintain throughout the off-season. This year was a little difficult because I had hernia surgery, like, just before prep at around 15 or weeks out or something. I can't really remember. But as soon as I recovered from surgery, it was a quick recovery, maybe a week or so. But prep started pretty much right after that, at about fourteen weeks out. So fourteen weeks is is that typical? Like, is that pretty average for about? I think twelve is the most average. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, like in in powerlifting, for example, like a, a competition, you prep for like eight weeks, have one week to taper. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot more like quick. You're loading up for sure. You yeah. know, um, that's interesting. It makes more sense though if you're dieting for a competition to mm-hmm. go slow. Or yeah. else you'd uh, burn out. Yeah, I mean, the, the quicker you, if you crash diet for anything, the quicker you lose any weight, you're going to be losing muscle mass as well. So if you can do it in a more slow, gradual state, have time for like refeeds or diet breaks potentially in between, it's a lot more beneficial than just 
sucking it all off as quick, quick as you can. How, how important is it for somebody to have like a good coach in their corner if they're competing? I think it's like just something you need. Like people say they can coach themselves, but I think mentally it's such a hard part to be subjective to yourself. Okay, you kind of need a third eye looking at yourself. And I, my coach, he helps me a lot because he's he, to get a compliment out of him is like amazing. You know, <laughs> I think it was like two days before the Olympic. He was like kind of like shit you look like really good and that was like the first time I was like maybe I'm gonna win because up until that it was like I sent him pictures being like I look really good today and like yeah you look all right maybe let's cut out your sweet potato today you know so I was like fuck <laughs> obviously I don't look good you know yeah so I couldn't get a compliment from him. that kept me working hard he knows I think that I mean no he just doesn't get compliments but that works with me and even he is a great coach but he has a coach himself and I find just having someone who you kind of like like those days where I thought I'd look good, he made me think I didn't look that good, so that made me push harder. Right. And I think just having that sort of like third eye who's not like biased help, definitely helps a lot. And like for for a coach to come in, is that like helping you with your training as well, or is it only your uh, nutrition? For me, it's just nutrition. Right. Yeah. So, so you create your own programming. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, he like I said, I've been training. I trained with him so much when I was young. He got me to bodybuilding. We have very similar training techniques. But I found what works best for my body over the years, and I, I, I kind of enjoy creating that myself. So I've stuck to doing that alone. Cool. Um, if there's one place that you could travel to, where would that be? I'd say somewhere in Asia, maybe like Thailand or like Tokyo or something. Right. I would love to just have a like complete culture shock where everything's just so different. Like, just a, you feel like you're in a different world and no one even speaks your language. I just feel like that would be cool to kind of be submersed into that and just kind of like find your way around and try and communicate with people who can't talk as lick at English. <laughs> I think that would just be an interesting experience. Yeah, I think uh, I think a lot of like people go to like Bali, Indonesia. That looks like a nuts place. Yeah, yeah. The very Bali seems to be like a, a Instagram island right now or whatever. Yeah, like they like pay people to go and just take pictures and the. Oh really? Yeah, I never heard. Well, people who go don't pay the influencers you see. Well, get paid dude, to go. go there. I should, yeah. <laughs> that would be sweet. Hit them up for a free vacation or something. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how people get those, but... You should look into it. I should definitely. Yeah, yeah when you're not well, when you're not competing or yeah. whatever. Nice break. Yeah. Um, that's that's pretty much everything that I have for you, uh, unless there's anything else that you wanted to, to chit-chat about before we uh, sign off here. I think we pretty much covered everything. Yeah, I think so. I'm, like, buzzing here on the pre-workout that we sampled. <laughs> Tweaking earlier. a little bit. Now. Yeah, I'm like... And there's also like a snowstorm happening oh, outside shit, now. So. Yeah. yeah. Welcome to Ottawa. Yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Uh, yeah, it was good chatting with you, dude. It's it's really inspiring to me to see somebody who hit the top of a sport, even though it's not like a sport that I competed in, still like massive respect. And to see that you're still motivated to keep going, I love that. And I also like the, the biggest thing that I took away from this conversation is like how much of like a family man you are. Um, and I got nothing, nothing but respect for that. So appreciate it. Yeah. yeah, I got lucky to be surrounded by good people from the beginning. So try and keep them around me for sure. Cool man. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Donezo.